So hello everyone, welcome back. And thank you so much for joining us and staying with us for the LabLinks event, Batteries, Designing a Safe and Sustainable Future. My name is Shen Shen Zhang. I'm a scientific editor at Cellpress Flagship Sustainable, Sustainability Journal Winners and a moderator of this session. Joining me is my co-organizer, who also just moderated session one of today's event, Andy Mosbors, scientific editor at Cell Price flagship energy journal, Jewel. Following the presentation and panel discussion of the just ended session one, we've learned the importance of battery sustainability and the role of battery chemistry, manufacturing innovations, and battery management systems to make batteries better at an upstream. Now, moving on to session two, we're going to shed some light on the downstream and we'll touch upon battery decommissioning and circularity. Similar to session one, this session will begin with 15 minutes presentation by each speaker and then a 30 minutes panel discussion. I'd like to make a brief note here that it seems that we are unfortunately missing one speaker from this session, but I believe we will still have interesting talks and discussions. And before I will pass the stage to our speakers, I'd like to make a kind reminder here that apart from the presenter or others, including myself, we will all turn turn off our cameras. And I will pop up, pop up myself just as a reminder when the presentation is approaching to the 15th minute. Now, please allow me to introduce our first speaker, Anik Antel, Associate Professor at the College of Engineering, Michigan State University. Her research uses proactive sustainability assessment to reduce the environmental impact of new technologies, such as batteries. Anik, the floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction. Um, Okay, so uh, today I've been asked to uh, talk a little bit about the life cycle footprint of battery recycling. So I'm an associate professor here at Michigan State University. And um, most of my research is about life cycle assessment of uh, energy systems. So for, for battery and other type of um, energy technology, we're looking at what is the impact of mining, um, chill processing, making the technology in the use phase. But today we'll focus more about like the end of life and in particular, how can we return some of that material um, back to uh, making new battery uh, and ensure that we're uh, providing a sustainable uh, source of battery material in the future. So what is the motivation of our work? Uh, I think it's pretty obvious that the global EV cells are growing really quickly. So as we're uh, growing, we need more and more battery materials. Um, and like where um, the a lot of the change that was discussed in the previous session about like the change in battery chemistry, um, is important. There's a transition towards material that contains less valuable material, but at the same time, we still have for the foreseeable uh, future a need for some of those um, high value material. In particular, there's still quite a bit of like uh, nickel uh, NMC battery material uh, that will be needed. So with the growing need for, uh, for material and the reliance on uh, material that are pretty scarce, we need to develop uh, recycling uh, methods uh, to ensure our future supply. So if we look at where materials are extracted versus where they are processed, there's a kind of a big imbalance in terms of, uh, of location. So we need to consider like the geographical concentration uh, and the impact of um, uh, and uh, on a supply chain disruption could have in the future. Uh, the also concentration of those material in certain country could also affect the long-term availability in the material price, which uh, which is not good for car manufacturers. So um, developing a recycling facility, um, not just uh, in Asia or in Europe, but also here in North America is something that is uh, very important. So uh, in previous work, uh, we've done a lot of work uh, previously on like second life batteries. So I think this is something I might address a little bit more in the discussion or the panel discussion, but um, like the recycling is only what should be happening after the second life battery. So after uh, the battery is taken out of the electric vehicle, there's still quite a bit of 
life left. So we did a lot of work looking at what would be the cost and carbon footprint in various uh, battery application, including residential and utility application. And kind of the short result is they have very really good potential in particular for like um, fast charger application where uh, they perform very well and reduce the cost of fast charger application. We've also developed some uh, tools to help identify like what application would be best for second life battery with solar or non-solar. We've done also some analysis on like the using system dynamics about the uh, end of life of EV batteries that both combine like second life battery and recycling to look over time, like what would be the benefit of doing some um, second life battery before sending for recycling. So kind of what I wanna highlight here in terms of the, the finding is even though recycling is important, it's not gonna be like a major uh, impact in terms of like reducing the carbon footprint or replacing some of the battery material uh, for the next probably 10 years, just because we don't have the uh, amount of battery needed that reach ends of life or even like from the manufacturing stage uh, to replace a large portion of the material we need for, for new batteries. So uh, in this work, we kind of look at the dynamics and how changing uh, chemistry over time would uh, affect the availability of different material and the role of a second life battery versus uh, direct recycling of battery. Uh, overall, what is uh, going on right now, we're all aware that Asia has most of the recycling uh, capacity. Europe uh, has quite a bit of also plant capacity. In North America, we've been kind of lagging, but there's more and more announcement about uh, recycling facility uh, and more and more effort in growing uh, recycling uh, in North America. So the reason for that is mostly because of uh, policy reason and new requirement for battery material to be produced um, in in the US uh, in order to qualify for uh, for credit on, on new vehicle. So um, think demand for battery uh, and battery materials uh, is um, affecting the, this area of research. There's also a really quickly growing battery recycling and manufacturing industry in North America with, um, this is from the NASBAT uh, battery supply chain database that kind of identified like all the uh, existing and planned uh, facility for recycling. And what is happening in particular is a lot of those different companies are uh, developing different methods uh, that everybody say is the greener and the cheapest method for recycling materials, but they don't always compare uh, their methods uh, using the same uh, metrics. So what we're trying to do is compare side by side uh, existing or what is planned uh, recycling methods for uh, for battery, uh, lithium ion battery and see how do they compare in terms of uh, environmental impact and the, how does it compare uh, with um, new material mining? So obviously recycling reduces the environmental impact of uh, battery material, but how much is kind of the question that we're looking into. So if we look at the battery life cycle, uh, like the three different color kind of show the different types of uh, recycling method that we'll discuss today, but there's also a lot of different uh, consideration you need to take into account. So uh, in the, for example, like where was, uh, if you're making a new battery, where was the of the mine? Where is the refining location? What is the uh, grid carbon footprint? Particular for methods that require a lot of electricity. Same thing for all of the stage, like where things take place, how much uh, recycle content you're able to use, uh, what is the source of uh, your diff different chemicals and also virgin material will affect your results. Um, so, uh, and, those three different methods uh, kind of show, I'll show it a little bit better after I explain the different methods, but uh, depending on the methods, you're able to re-enter the battery uh, supply chain at a different point. So uh, if you're doing pyro, then you're kind of pretty far, you still need to readjust a lot of your chemistry versus if you're able to kind of skip some step and um, go straight pretty much uh, to active material uh, production. So, Kind of the most traditional method for recycling uh, and the oldest method for uh, producing metal in general is using pyrometallurgy. So in this method, uh, we need to disassemble the battery. Then uh, we kind of send everything uh, in a smelter and like smelting is the oldest way again to produce most metals. Uh, and then we have leaching and cobalt nickel extraction. We can also uh, recover uh, lithium with newer methods. And finally we uh, produce um, kind of active material uh, from the result. So from this uh, method, kind of the positive side is that we're, that's an ex 
existing method. We've been doing that for a long time. So it's an established process. We also don't size results. So like the first is a sample of quick, uh, but it's the uh, in the process, but most uh, and carbon from As a result, this is the second which Well, there's no carbon, but uh, there's a lot more uh, demand. It's a lot of chemical bleaching, and also as we see those uh, metals using a lot of uh, base metal, it's in the form of with waste that needs to be treated. So we need to treat that wastewater if we don't want, want to have uh, other types of environmental impact. We also need to kind of do some pretreatment and how you're reducing and what kind of um, preparation you have with your material will impact uh, how, how good your uh, material recovery would be. So another methods we compare and that I'll show result on for today is called, uh, we'll call it like truncated hydrometallurgy. So in this case, kind of the main difference is that we're not separating all the elements. So we're producing PCAM instead of uh, kind of a mix of precursor, and then we can just adjust the chemistry and send them back for chem production. But again, uh, it is similar to hydrometallurgy, so we don't have the CO2 emission, but we do add a lot of chemicals um, required for, for that process. So if I kind of summarize what I just said and going back to this figure, uh, like all different uh, technology would have different uh, product that are uh, produced. So pyro will produce uh, the less. If you're doing um, hydro, then you need to do mechanical pretreatment and get a black mass before you can extract similar uh, metals. Uh, if you're doing the advanced uh, recycling process or truncated hydrometallurgy that I'm gonna call it, uh, then you can also produce a lot of byproducts that depending on the market condition might be valuable or not. So that's another kind of benefit of this uh, technology. So again, like what we do in our group, we do a lot of life cycle assessments. So we look at uh, what is the impact of those uh, doing those different recycling methods. And in particular, we're interested in looking at what is the impact of those recycling methods, depending on where we're doing it, uh, what kind of battery mix we're putting in, and uh, how much are we trying to replace in, in new batteries. So uh, the kind of question we're answering is like, what is the environmental impact of lithium ion battery recycling based on recycling method, location, and how does it change over time? So for this work today, um, what we consider for like, what is the input is a mix of NMC811 and NMC622. So we can also adjust that for looking at future uh, battery mix. Um, and then we look at everything that is put in uh, versus like how much gets out uh, in the form of waste. And we assume that we're producing NMC811 um, as the new battery there. So this is kind of a similar diagram, uh, but showing like the life cycle assessment as system boundary uh, and all of the byproduct that happens in uh, the different uh, stage and how they get back into uh, the final product to produce a new NMC, depending if you're doing pyrometallurgy or um, hydrometallurgy. So in this work uh, today, what I want to show is just the some case study we've been doing, looking at a uh, different scenario for North American um, battery recycling. So if we look at one scenario, uh, a lot of the recycling facilities that are planned are in Ontario. Uh, so we're looking at a scenario where everything kind of stays in Ontario versus a uh, scenario in the uh, US where things uh, are being transported in between two states. Uh, in particular, the states of interest uh, that we're considering are um, 
well, in those regions. So it's mostly in Georgia or uh, Tennessee region where there are a lot of uh, recycling uh, and battery manufacturing plants. So we're considering the specific electricity and uh, environmental impact of producing in those regions. So um, what the result, what we're uh, saying uh, is overall, if you're looking at the hydrometeorology versus parameterology, uh, I'm looking at three uh, indicator freshwater toxicity water consumption and global warming potential this is not like uh, like a total this uh, figure uh, highlight how much uh, each of the stage uh, contribute to the total result so it is pretty obvious that for both uh, hydrometeorology and parameterology for all impact categories the leaching uh, mineral extraction and purification has the most impact uh, for uh, the hydrometeorology, then the second one would be like the size reduction in production uh, versus like uh, the smelting here, but the other uh, stage have the most impact. So the next thing we wanted to look at uh, is how would that change over time if uh, you're doing uh, this scenario in like Canada versus the US uh, and the red shows the pyrometeorology versus the hydrometeorology. So if I kind of look, using electricity as there is the carbonization of the grid, uh, you're we're able to reduce the carbon footprint of recycling by up to 15%, uh, which still doesn't match the Canadian impact, but it is uh, lower over time as uh, due to grid decarbonization. So uh, if we look at uh, different aspects and comparing like the US Canada for each of the stage, so producing the recycled material for pyro as uh, higher carbon footprint, which is not necessarily surprising, but uh, uh, the, the different uh, like the square, the the cross versus the diamond uh, show uh, the different country and for uh, pyro, for example, uh, you're able to reduce that by changing the location. Um, and then the main factor that impact the uh, impact on MC production would be where you're doing the uh, new material production. Uh, and if you're using secondary material from pyrometeorology, that's one way you can reduce future the water consumption and toxicity by up to um, 30%. So uh, it is uh, for this one, we're looking at the production of NMC N11. So uh, we can, as part of the modeling we're doing, like depending on what we're trying to uh, produce, then uh, the result will change a little bit. Um, so by changing the by one of the big area of work in the US is grid decarbonization. So if we're uh, looking at the impact of decarbonization of the grid over time, uh, we can reduce the carbon footprint by about like 20%, the water consumption by 17% and the freshwater toxicity by 3%. So obviously grid decarbonization doesn't have a huge impact on freshwater toxicity, but still a little bit, but there is a um, much lower reduction in Canada because there's already a really high uh, share of clean energy source uh, being used for uh, producing uh, electricity, both because of nuclear and uh, renewable use. So uh, leaching for both uh, hydro and pyro has the largest environmental impact. Uh, the environmental footprint of battery recycling and cathode production depends on the source of electricity, the source of chemical use, the recycling technology, but also the grid decarbonization. Uh, recycling and cathode material production in Canada have a much lower environmental impact than in the US. Um, Pyro re uh, recycling consume a lot less water than hydrometeorology and have lower freshwater toxicity, but the pyro has a uh, higher carbon footprint. And if we uh, focus on the grid decarbonization and potential for reducing environmental impact, it could reduce the carbon footprint and water consumption uh, by 20 and 17% respectively. So I want to thank um, my group and in particular people that work in this project. So Francis has been the main lead on that uh, work. Liao did work on the grid decarbonization modeling, uh, and we have um, other master and undergrad students that have helped with data collection and so on. So thank you.
Thank you so much, Anik, for this very interesting talk on the end-of-life management of batteries. We, I've learned a lot, and which I think sets a very nice thing for the session too. For this session too, um, we look forward to discussing it more in the panel discussion. And uh, now let's move on to our next speaker, um, Andy Abbott, professor at the School of Chemistry, University of Leicester, and a partner in the Faraday Institution Project Relief Recycling Lithium Iron Batteries. His research interests are firmly based around green chemistry with a particular emphasis on material processing and a strong collaboration with industry. Andy, please go ahead. Thanks, Shan Shan. Um, so I'd like to talk to you today about how we could design lithium ion batteries so they were easier to recycle. And I'll show you some uh, results of, of different techniques for uh, short loop recycling that we've been looking at as part of the uh, Faraday Institution's really project. So just to put things into perspective, and I, I realize that there's a global audience here, I'll, I'll do it in terms of the, the UK centric to start with. So um, UK has, has about sort of 65 million people. We've got about uh, a million vehicles that get, get scrapped every year. Um, and when we get to roughly half the UK's fleet being electric, which you can debate when that might be, but well into the 2030s, um, that's gonna be the equivalent of about 1,200 vehicles per day um, that is going to be uh, recycled. And given that each vehicle contains between a third and a half a ton of battery, um, what we're going to see is that um, we're going to rapidly get to a battery recycling um, process that's going to need to be probably about 10 times the current scale of the lead acid battery um, recycling system. So in terms of the cost of this, what we can do is to work backwards to say, okay, well, if we have a $100 per kilowatt hour uh, worth of, of battery, how much is that actually going to, to cost? And of course, it depends upon the value of the materials that we get out of it. But realistically, if we're not going to charge a gate fee, which hopefully by the 2030s will be the case, um, then we've got somewhere between two to six dollars uh, per kilogram of battery uh, that we can use. And that, that's a number that's now been sort of commonly adopted. So if you if you think about the sort of the, the practical side of, of doing that, then the inputs in terms of energy and in terms of uh, chemicals is going to have to be very, very low. Uh, so there's a, a review here um, where we, we've sort of done this, this retroeconomic analysis. Uh, and you can see that actually it's going to have to be a very simple recycling process. And um, hopefully most of you will actually have seen um, lithium ion batteries. Uh, what you realize is they are exceedingly complex. Um, and it, probably many of you have not tried to pull these things apart, or at least I hope you haven't tried to pull these things apart. Um, what you'll find is they are exceedingly difficult. Uh, so we work a lot with uh, Nissan and Nissan Leaf uh, cells and, and modules. Um, I think our current uh, time to uh, dismantle a module uh, is around about uh, two hours. That's our sort of record time to get from module down to cell. So what you can see is that it's a very labor intensive process, mostly due to the fact that uh, lots of glues and clips and screws are used um, within that overall uh, cell design. Uh, and there's a, uh, a, a nice review at the bottom here uh, by my colleague Jacqueline Edge uh, in Applied uh, Energy last year, uh, where she looked at the amount of time that it would take to um, manually disassemble a cell uh, as opposed to robotically disassembling a cell. And what she's done is looked at about six different um, uh, OEM manufacturers. And what you see is that typically it can take between sort of eight hours for a manual disassembly down to just over an hour for a robotic disassembly. And so just doing the analysis of that, we can see that when we get to the 2030s, it is absolutely vital that we have robotic disassembly as well as robotic assembly. Um, and so we can see that um, you know, taking a, a Tesla Model S, for example, um, it has about 4,000 individual uh, cells um, which are held together with strong adhesives and uh, welds. And so these things are not trivial um, to be able to pull apart. And in most cases, what we see is that the reason that pyrometallurgy uh, is favored at the moment is because we don't have to do a complex um, disassembly. However, we're losing a lot of the elements uh, in that process. So we need a better battery um, design such that it's easier to pull apart. 
So here's a very simple um, idea that we came up with, uh, and I won't uh, do the video for the moment, but there's, there's a link there at the bottom. Uh, what we did was we changed the form factor. So we, we took a, a sort of small Nissan Leaf with uh, eight uh, cells there, and we did the very simple thing of just uh, confining the edges. So we joined all the edges together. So rather than having um, uh, the cells which could move independently of each other, we made them in a long line, which is the way in which they would normally be made. Um, and uh, what we did was rather than using uh, epoxy resins to hold these cells together, we used just pressure sensitive adhesives um, at the corners. And we could change the way in which these uh, cells were held together. Uh, and we had some uh, robots at the University of Birmingham, uh, which did the manipulation such that we could uh, pull the cell out of the holder and dismantle it into this uh, long line of cells in under a minute, um, as opposed to two hours. So you can see that there are a simple design modifications that could simplify this robotic disassembly. We've also done a robotic opening um, where we've taken a variety of different methods from sort of knives through to sort of water uh, knives to sort of slice along one edge uh, of the uh, pack. And uh, we can then disassemble these cells rather than having to uh, shred them. So as part of the overall uh, process, what we can see is that when a, set, a car arrives to be um, recycled, we need to do triage um, to see what kind of uh, state of health it's in. We then need to, to look at how we can uh, pull those uh, cells apart um, to then get the components out, efficiently separate them. And the really important bit that we haven't really addressed today is how do we retain that maximum value in the material? And usually the answer is don't shred it. Um, and so how do we then go from you know, we've, we've seen these sort of um, uh, euphemistically um, put together uh, uh, 811 um, battery chemistries. We're not going to see those for probably 10, 15 years. Just about everything we're looking at at the moment is sort of mixtures of LMO with, with a variety of other additives in them. So very low value in most cases, uh, battery materials. How do we regenerate those to modern battery chemistries? And that's something, again, we've been having a look at. Um, and how are we able to make this into a profitable process and make new cells out of that? So that's, that's really the, the questions that we need to address. And so as part of the uh, Relib process, we've got uh, 14 pieces of intellectual property that we've been developing, everything from pack triage, which we've um, already perfected and, and have uh, installed with, with Nissan in, in Sunderland, uh, round to sort of disassembly, as, as I've just sort of uh, intimated, uh, we've looked at ways in which we can separate cells, but also shred them and look at then physical separation and uh, optimize black mass uh, separation. We've also got some work at the University of Edinburgh where we're doing biological um, recovery of metals and upcycling materials uh, into nanocatalysts, for example, uh, and being able to uh, selectively extract both nickel or manganese or cobalt from any battery chemistry. We've also looked at ways of upcycling um, graphite to graphene, changing the chemical composition, regenerating, and the important bit about that regeneration is it has to be a low temperature process to be able to get a, 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 an economical process and also to have a minimal LCA impact. We then looked at novel ways of casting these materials with hopefully better binders than the PVDF that's currently used and ways of assembling them into new pack designs. So what everyone knows is that uh, what we're trying to get to or what everyone's focusing on at the moment is the cathode active materials because those have by far the largest uh, value by, by composition. However, what we should do is to also focus on the other active materials and see how many of those we can get back in a pure form. And the real problem associated with this is that the components have very similar physical properties and there are lots and lots of different components in there which are usually very difficult to separate and we've heard already about the complexity of pvdf which is a nightmare to that recycling process so we carried out um, a life cycle analysis whether it was better to shred or to uh, separate samples we carried out data from our own processes and those from the literature. 
And what we found was that you could get a significant cost saving, maybe even up to 80%, uh, as opposed to mining those, those uh, materials by separating rather than shredding those materials. Um, so but the problem is at the moment, as we've said, the, the uh, battery designs are not conducive to be able to separate. And so probably for the next 10 to 15 years, shredding is probably one of the main ways forward. Although there are some exceptions out there uh, that I'll discuss in a minute where people are already disassembling cells. Um, so one of the innovations that we've put into our processes is to use um, ultrasonic delamination of electrodes. And this works particularly well for production scrap. So we take the electrodes and we pass them under an ultrasonic horn. Uh, and this is a, a small demonstration unit that we've got in our labs in Leicester, uh, where we have a, uh, an automatic uh, suction device that, that picks up the electrodes, puts them onto a conveyor belt, and those are then fed underneath the ultrasonic horn uh, and give us our pure um, uh, current collectors within about five seconds. So we can take a, a 20 centimeter typical uh, electrode and delaminate it in around about five seconds. So a very simple process, which is akin to the, the sort of process that you get when you go to the dentist and have your teeth cleaned. Um, so just to give you an idea for this, this is a, shows the sort of manual version of it. This is uh, my postdoc Chun Hong who's developed the process. And you can see that in a few seconds, it goes underneath the sonic horn, not heated up, not speeded up here. And I've only done it on the anode here because it, it just gives you very clear visual uh, context of it. Uh, the electrode is delaminated uh, and separated um, in about five seconds. So you can see it's a very simple technology, low energy, and just uses water to be able to do that process. We can then take that material um, and in under an hour between getting material, uh, we can cast it into uh, new electrode materials. We've even done it with um, production scrap where we've just reactivated the current binder that's on there and recast it. So we think that you can get a cost saving of typically sort of 60% uh, as opposed to using uh, virgin material and around about a 10% cost saving just using um, traditional acidic media. So we've shown that we can regenerate the cells uh, for high performance already. So in terms of that design for recycle, the really vital part in here is that we are able to create a pack and module and cell that's easier to handle. And we've seen already coming out of China uh, some um, ideas where this design for recycle is, is in place. So if we look at the BYD uh, blade cells uh, that you can see pictured on the um, right hand side of the screen, uh, what they've got is a long um, aspects. Um, they've got anode and cathode uh, chemistries at, at opposite ends, which means that it's easier to separate out those um, anode and cathode chemistries um, mechanically. They've got very few connectors, um, almost no uh, glues in, used inside their modules. Um, and what we've got is, is sort of larger cells with, with no modules. So we've got a straight cell to uh, pack uh, structure. Uh, what we're trying to develop, as, as of many other groups, is, is more soluble binders or no binder uh, based systems. And these ease the way in which we can separate those active materials away from the uh, current collectors. We've also just started a project using uh, debondable adhesives, where if you, if you physically can't get away from using uh, an adhesive, what you can do is you can put a trigger in there, which can be activated by light or heat. Uh, that actually debonds the polymer uh, at end of life. Uh, and there's um, uh, three references at the bottom of this slide here uh, to both uh, debondable adhesives, but also the use of um, new battery designs that enable uh, simpler battery um, separation and purification. So going forward, what we can see is that there are going to be some very important um, strides that need to be uh, taken forward to get this um, optimum recycling market. So clearly at the moment, what we're going to be doing is ensuring product quality, product safety, and that's quite clear up into sort of 2035. Um, and what we're going to see is that shredding um, probably up until 2040 is going to be the only uh, game in town. Um, 
we're going to then sort of regenerate through that sort of purification, but probably a lot of those materials are going to end up being downcycled rather than upcycled or recycled. Hopefully for um, production scrap, um, we're going to get to a system whereby we can simply delaminate, separate those materials and reuse those. Uh, and there are new technologies coming onto the market, which hopefully we will see uh, relatively soon. And then hopefully as we get towards the sort of 2040s, uh, once that sort of um, exploited invested capital has, has been achieved, we'll start to see new cells, uh, which will enable us to recycle and get material back of higher purity and therefore decrease the cost of using reused uh, material. And then what we're trying to do, obviously, in everything that we do is to uh, ensure that this doesn't just apply to, to lithium. But this also applies to solid state and other types of batteries uh, as well. I'll put a little link at the bottom there, a little YouTube video. There's a company in Switzerland called Kyberts um, who have already uh, used a process, uh, albeit for uh, LFP batteries, um, where they are uh, disassembling uh, their cells. Uh, and getting very pure um, anode and cathode streams out of their uh, processes. We've got a project here uh, in the UK uh, called ReBlend, where we are uh, producing a, a pilot scale um, process. Again, what we're trying to do here is, is not produce black mass, but to separate out um, our active material. Um, and we're using this ultrasonic delamination uh, with our uh, material. And we are, rather than fine shredding, we're doing very, very coarse shredding. Um, and what we're able to do is to separate out our uh, anode material very simply, and that's relatively pure. We're then taking our uh, material in the sort of blue frame in the middle that you can see. Uh, you can see the copper foils to see where the, uh, the carbon has been delaminated. We're then putting that uh, underneath our ultrasonic horn and ending up with just foils, the uh, plastic separates out through uh, gravity, and we end up with a very pure uh, cathode stream um, of active material at the end of that process. So we can see that by rethinking and re redesigning that process and using new tools in that um, separation, we can lead to higher value uh, materials much more rapidly uh, than current technology. So what I hope I've shown you is that um, uh, there isn't a quick fix in place uh, for recycling lithium ion batteries. Um, we're seeing that um, it's going to be an iterative uh, process of being able to just firstly make materials, current materials safe, then hopefully recycling production scrap efficiently, uh, getting through to uh, new designs and ensuring that those recycling techniques work for all uh, materials. So you can find more about our work, our work at the Relib website. And also there's a very comprehensive um, uh, roadmap of lithium ion battery recycling, which was published last year in JFIS Energy and the references at the end there. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you. Many thanks, Andy, for your very insightful talk on leveraging better battery design to make batteries easier for recycling. With many interesting fun facts and cutting edge like robot, robotic innovations. I'm sure we'll touch upon more on this in the panel discussion. So now we will welcome our final speaker of session two, uh, Yatming Qian, Professor of Material Science and Engineering at MIT, and also the co-founder of Form Energy, a US-based energy storage technology and manufacturing company that aims to make excellent energy storage for a better world. Yatming's research aims to design, synthesize, and character characterize advanced materials and devices for use in clean energy technologies. Yatming, the floor is yours. Thank you. Let me first make sure that you can hear me clearly. Yes. Everything okay? All right, terrific. And I want to thank the uh, previous two speakers for teeing up this topic so nicely uh, for me. Uh, I'd like to talk about uh, three things, uh, each briefly. Uh, one is, you know, what is the scale of uh, battery production that we will need in the coming, let's say, three decades from now till uh, 2050? Uh, the second is to uh, give you a, another example that follows on to Professor Abbott's talk of, of uh, uh, lithium-ion battery recycling. And the third is about 
uh, batteries that use inherently uh, widely available and sustainable materials. So let me uh, go ahead and get started here. Uh, I wanted to just reference uh, at the very beginning here, a study that we completed last year at MIT called the Future of Energy Storage. And this really was a study focused around uh, grid storage, uh, but there were some uh, important takeaways here that I wanted to uh, share with you. And the first is, you know, what is the installed volume of uh, storage that we expect to need for decarbonization? And so to uh, you'll see in bolded uh, the numbers uh, that are on the order of 100 terawatt hours. So uh, in this study, our estimate for decarbonization of the electricity system by 2050, the uh, estimated installed storage is 100 terawatt hours of grid storage. And to put that in perspective, if there are about 10 billion uh, humans on the planet in 2050, that's a battery pack about the size of a, um, a good size electric vehicle supporting uh, you know, uh, every 10 people, 10 persons electrical needs. So that uh, it puts it in uh, some, uh, gives you a skill uh, for that. The second is this doesn't even include electric vehicles. And you see at the bottom that that could be over 100 terawatt hours right there. So we're talking about a couple of hundred terawatt hours of uh, uh, batteries between now and 2050. And uh, where will all that come from? And how can we do it sustainably? Right? Well, uh, lithium ion, uh, I think uh, all of us are well aware of the massive cost down. Uh, that's the plot on the left. Uh, and the uh, Plot on the right is a projection of what production uh, volumes will be between now and 2030. And the main point I want to make here is that the compound annual growth rates of production, uh, in order to meet those targets, needs to be something greater than 20% continuously for the next 26 years. Right? So this is really, a, these are huge volumes that we're talking about. And when we think about materials that go into these uh, storage systems, what I have here are just a, just four of them, lithium, cobalt, nickel, vanadium, uh, the first three for lithium ion, the, the, the fourth for uh, ostensibly vanadium redox flow batteries. And there are uh, three columns here. The far right one is the resource limit, how much we know uh, to be in the ground that we've uh, identified. And what you see here is that, except for cobalt, there's actually uh, enough of a resource. Uh, the middle column is the CAGR that we would need to get to that 100 terawatt hours. And what you see here are numbers between, you know, on the order of 10 to as much as 25%. The left column is the historical CAGR. And this is, uh, over the last uh, roughly three decades, what's the most increase in production we've had in a given year? What you see is that we need to press the, you know, everything in red means we need to exceed historical CAGRs, not only for one year, but continuously for the next uh, uh, 25 years or so. And so uh, with respect to what Professor Anktel said earlier, you know, the, uh, the idea that in an exponentially growing market, it's hard for recycling to catch up, uh, I think uh, rings true. And the uh, idea that you know it won't be for another ten years before recycling really puts a dent into that supply chain, uh, I would agree with. Uh, and well, the other way to look at it is that uh, when that time does come, uh, we have to be ready, and that's uh, why recycling is important today. Right? We have ten years to get it right, in other words. Right? Okay, so let me now move on and talk about a specific technology, uh, which was designed for a number of reasons, uh, but one of them was more efficient recycling. About uh, a little over 10 years ago, so actually in 2010, uh, we spun a technology out of uh, MIT. Uh, and the approach of this technology was to uh, reinvent the way that we make lithium ion batteries today. I think uh, almost everybody in this audience is uh, aware of the basics of lithium ion battery manufacturing, where you coat foils, dry those foils, uh, remove a solvent, whether it's water or NMP, uh, you know, calendar, slit, uh, and, and, and make a cell, et cetera. Right? And so uh, in order to get around all of those steps, we created a different kind of electrode, and we ended up calling it a semi-solid electrode. And basically what it is, is a 
uh, active material carbon electrolyte mixture with no binder, right? So uh, no PVDF in this case. And what it allowed was that we could make an electrode that would be electrochemically active as fabricated and take it directly to a cell, no drying, right? And you, uh, I've listed here a number of the advantages of, of uh, take doing it this way. And so this is a technology that somewhat quietly has been scaling over the last few years. And I'll show you a couple of snapshots here. Uh, so first of all, uh, there's no uh, there's no coating line. Right? You've taken away the coating line. Uh, there is a casting process with what is a you know, a thick uh, paste or slurry directly onto metal foils, uh, with which you can build a, a cell. We call it a unit cell, which is a pair of electrodes, right? Uh, which is encased in low cost plastic, and then. Uh, these cells have been uh, proven out in both uh, LFP chemistries, you know, almost a decade ago, and more recently in uh, NMC EV cells, for example, 50 amp hour cell here. And so um, there are uh, interesting characteristics. You see a, a picture in the upper uh, right here of extreme deformation, which is possible without uh, causing a fire or an, even a short circuit within the cell. And that's because it's a softer electrode. Right. It's a thicker, thicker, softer electrode. But let me talk a little bit about the uh, about the recycling of these, which is the uh, far right here. Right. Okay, so this goes uh, directly towards the point that Professor Abbott was making. Let's avoid shredding. Right. The so-called unit cells at the end of life uh, can be uh, you know, unzipped, almost like a Ziploc bag. Right. And the cathode and anode both can be removed, as you see in the upper left-hand corner here, and just by simple you know, mechanical scraping, because there actually is no uh, binder in there. It's a binder-free system. Right? Now, if we were to ask, you know, what is wrong with the carbon, the, the graphite anode, and the LFP cathode now at the end of life? I would say that what's wrong is that we've transferred some of the lithium irreversibly, over to the anode. So we have an SEI there of primarily lithium carbonate. We've lost some of the lithium, therefore, in the cathode. So it's a little bit deficient in uh, lithium. And there's probably a, there's, you know, a pretty widespread, there are probably crystallographic defects that have been formed in both these active materials. However, it's possible to, to fix that. So with the graphite, for example, that lithium carbonate is soluble in water. It can just be, be rinsed, right? With the LFP, you can restore that lithium with, for example, a low temperature roasting process with lithium carbonate. You can, you know, that 15% or so of missing lithium. If you do all that, you get the results that are shown here. You, uh, what we've shown is that you can take that LFP essentially back to the same performance as the starting uh, pristine LFP. Uh, and so this is a, an example that, um, uh, that, at this point for 24M, which is the technology, the company has developed this technology, is again, a forward looking advantage because there's not enough volume out there, but goes towards those objectives that Professor Abbott mentioned. All right, let me now move on and talk about uh, uh, really sustainable materials for storage. And in this case, uh, grid storage. And uh, the main point I want to make with this slide is uh, these are things that, again, I think uh, everybody listening in probably knows uh, that you know, we have to add storage to low cost electricity. And in particular, the competition is natural gas. Right? So uh, in order to displace natural gas as an electricity uh, producing fuel, we need to take renewable electricity, add to it the cost of storage and come out better than natural gas. Right. So, uh, this leads to the question, uh, which um, is uh, uh, asked uh, fairly widely of, well, uh, what is the duration of storage that you need in order to accomplish those objectives? And it varies by location, uh, you know, clearly. Uh, but the idea that we need longer duration storage than uh, what we've uh, been able to satisfy with lithium ion uh, is now uh, uh, being recognized. Right? And what I want to make as a point here is that what we really need today in, in the next phase of this energy transition is multi-day storage. That's what long duration storage uh, really should mean. 
And so this map here is the year 2021, 12 months, 30 uh, days per month in the state of Texas. And what I've circled now here are the dropouts between the black line, which is the demand, and the blue and the red, which are the wind and the solar available. Right. And what you see is that the gaps that need to be bridged are a few days. Right? And so if we take that to be the definition of the most pressing need in long duration storage, uh, I'll round that off to 100 hours and define what it is we need in terms of storage in order to meet that kind of a need. Right? As I said earlier, you know, our competition is natural gas. And so the left side of this equation is the natural gas plant lifetime cost, $2,000 a kilowatt. Okay. If the duration we're trying to bridge is 100 hours, well, it, we need $20 a kilowatt hour of an installed battery cost. And this is something that lithium ion cannot do today. Uh, I, and I think it's doubtful that it will ever be able to do it. And this leads to the need for lower cost chemistries. Well, there are many that are possible. I'm going to jump to one answer, right, which seems especially attractive today, uh, which is the iron air battery, uh, which uh, has been referred to as operating through a principle of reversible rusting. And so on the left here, shown schematically, is that uh, when we discharge this battery, what happens is that the iron spontaneously uh, would like to oxidize, and that's the rusting process. And the charging of the battery is electrically unrusting the iron. And so that's a simple description of uh, uh, what is happening chemically inside this battery. Uh, it turns out that the design of this battery that Form Energy, the company that is developing this technology, has developed is uh, has a, a couple of other interesting features about it. So I want to use this slide to explain uh, two points. Uh, one is that in this case, there are actually two air electrodes. You have an iron anode, but you have, to have two air electrodes. And one breathes in air, that's the gas diffusion electrode. The other uh, breathes out air, that's the oxygen evolution electrode. Right? And this is done for a number of technical reasons that I won't go into right now. Right? So this is the actual design of the iron air battery. The right-hand side shows you that in, by electrochemical terms, this type of battery is actually much less efficient than a lithium ion battery. If you look at the voltage gap between the charge discharge curve, as well as the capacity gap between the charge and discharge curve, you see that there is both a Faradaic inefficiency and a voltage inefficiency. Together, the round trip efficiency is on the order of only about 50%. So much worse than a lithium ion battery. But it turns out that when one looks at the use case models, this lower efficiency is tolerable. And what wins is the low cost of the materials. The fact that you can approach at a system level, $20 a kilowatt hour, about an order of magnitude less than a lithium ion battery today. Right? And so this is what is compelling about the use case. Right? And what further um, motivates this technology is the fact that there is a large and existing iron supply chain already. Right? What this slide illustrates is that, you know, on the way from iron ore to iron used for steel making and other purposes, there are a number of steps here. But the advent of the electric arc furnace displacing the blast furnace for steel making has led to a intermediate technology producing iron to feed electric arc furnaces. Electric arc furnaces are able to melt iron. They're not able to reduce iron ore. And so direct reduced iron is that pro intermediate product. And it's essentially pelletized iron ore that has been turned into iron uh, through a reduction process with natural gas. And so, this is the lowest cost form of metallic iron today and makes an ideal material to use in something like an iron air battery. Right. So uh, here are a couple of numbers about scaling just to give you uh, a, 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 a perspective here. Uh, these two iron barges that are illustrated here 
is enough iron, roughly 4,000 tons of iron for a gigawatt hour of iron air battery. Okay? And just you know, one iron reduction plant today produced about 2 million tons of iron, a half a terawatt hour of battery per year. So if we reflect back to that number that I uh, uh, used earlier of 100 terawatt hours by 2050, well, it's a very small perturbation on that supply chain, less than 1% increase in iron production, very much unlike the uh, the other metals I discussed earlier. And it's a global supply chain that already exists. Okay. The map in the lower right shows you where uh, DRI iron production is uh, concentrated in the world today. And the common feature is that it's actually located where natural gas is the cheapest. Okay. So, well, uh, what's the future trend here? It's to replace that natural gas with green hydrogen. Okay. And so uh, we imagine that widespread uh, use of iron air batteries would tie into that iron supply chain. And the, you know, on the, uh, the current trend in progress of moving away from natural gas and towards hydrogen as the reducing agent for uh, the production of DRI and that this can be a essentially a virtuous uh, loop here. All right, I'm almost done. Uh, what do these iron air batteries actually look like? This is just a snapshot of Farm Energy's uh, uh, you know, homepage. And what you see in the background is what a full-scale iron air battery uh, looks like. It's about the size of a washer dryer set all together. And what you see there are a number of uh, individual cells, each of which is about a meter squared uh, face area. Right? And uh, where this technology is today from the manufacturing perspective is that in the state of West Virginia, on the site of a former steel mill, the Weirton Steel Mill, uh, is being built a gigafactory, a 50 gigawatt hour per year production uh, facility uh, for iron air batteries. And so with that, I'm going to stop here and I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much again, Yetling, for your very engaging talk on making better batteries from lab to market. I believe we will touch more on, on this in our panel discussion. And please know, uh, all of us, we can turn on our cameras and off, uh, also we can unmute ourselves. And thank you all once again for sharing your thoughts and insights on these all these very exciting topics. A key point of the of obtained from these talks, um, I think, is that we need to convert the current take-make-waste linear module to a more circular approach that is key to enabling sustainable batteries. And there are pressing challenges, but also many exciting opportunities. So we will now move on to our panel discussion, and let's chat more about that. And for the first question, I would like to pitch it to, to Andy. So we, we all know that um, although batteries today can be recharged for many times, they still have a lifespan, like usually for lithium iron batteries, maybe five to eight years. Given the booming electric vehicle sales that I, I believe um, all of you have shown that slide in, in your uh, talks, the volume of retired lithium ion batteries could be huge. So Andy, um, how intensive the uh, lithium ion battery recycling challenge is likely to get given the st uh, status of current battery recycling technology? Yeah, I think um, it's, it's very strange because I, th I think the product that we're, we're seeing will actually uh, change and the way in which people use their vehicles will also change. So I, I heard a talk um, back end of last year, where they were saying that most electric vehicles go through about six users before they are finally scrapped. And, and so what we're finding is that um, the uh, demographic as, as to who's using electric vehicles is changing. So um, there's range anxiety for the first two owners. Uh, and after the first two owners, the next four don't really care. So it's going into a different sort of part of the market where it's going to you know, run to the shops and you know, do, do the school run, et cetera. Um, and, and so I think that the vehicles are being used for longer, certainly longer than their sort of 70 percent state of health that, that uh, the manufacturers are, um, uh, are saying at the moment. Um, so I think that there's going to be a delay before these things come to the market. We're seeing at the moment almost no vehicles other than uh, accidents 
um, or uh, or recalls, which are actually coming to the uh, coming to the market. Um, so I think it, it's going to be a while before there is a, a significant impact. But I, I see that, you know, that these things can be multiplied. You know, they, there are already two gigafact uh, two. I suppose they are gigafactories really uh, in in China, which which are already able to to deal with a hundred thousand tons a year. Um, which you know, for example, would be, would be more than you know countries like the UK would would use in total. So you know, I think scaling this technology um, is relatively easy. Making it um, viable in terms of getting um, um, precious materials back again, I think may take a bit of time. Um, but I think it, it's going to mirror very similarly the uh, what we've seen with you know lead acid battery. Um, markets where you know we've got one of the most recycled materials on the planet in terms of the lead acid battery and I think as as this becomes a more usable technology then that will um will come to the fore but you know it's just like our, our last speak you know I, th I think that lithium if we look maybe 50 years into the future I think lithium will just be a sort of oh yes do you remember lithium kind of thing um and uh, I think it is it's a transitory um technology but one that we need to you know, be able to deal with, because like we, everyone said, it's going to be a huge, huge scale. Thanks, Andy. And Yeming seems to have some something to comment. Yeah, I just wanted to comment. It, it seems to me that historically, uh, EV uh, and, you know, uh, including hybrid uh, car producers have uh, you know, overestimated the driving range, but underestimated the life of their batteries. <laughs> and, you know, uh, even even with the original Prius, that nickel metal hydride battery lasted far longer uh, than you know I've had it uh, lasted far longer than originally projected. So yeah, this five to eight years, I I you know I agree that's uh, that is not the end of life <laughs> as we think of it today. Uh, my uh, I will say you know I I drive a a converted Prius, which has my own lithium iron phosphate cells in it, made by A one two three back in the year 2009, okay, installed a relatively small five kilowatt hour pack. Uh, and because it's small and because it's a uh, it's a plug-in, every time I take, take the car to work, it's a full deep cycle, right? All right, so 2009 to today, it's you know 15 years and 163,000 miles and the capacity of the pack is down to about 60%, right? Am I going to get rid of it <laughs> to Andy's point? No, it's perfectly good. Unfortunately, the car is rusting out. The battery pack is still fine. So I've recently bought a replacement car that's rust-free from, uh, from New Mexico. And I'm going to swap the pack into that new car and just keep driving and, and continue this long, <laughs> this long duration road test. Right? So um, anyway. <laughs> Thank you. Just wanted to add to Andy's comments. Thanks, Yevin. I think that's that's very very interesting and very useful for me to kind of update my old knowledge. And again, thanks, Andy, for your for your insights on the sc scalability and also the uh, the capacity that um, how how good our recycling infrastructure are actually uh, accumulating at. And following up that, I would like to pitch a question to uh, Amic. So it seems like we're we're good at uh, building up our recycling infrastructure, and we we could have that capacity that will definitely meet our demand for better recycling. But um, from your presentation, I think you've mentioned that there are still some like social environmental impacts um, along the kind of better recycling process. Would you like to kind of unpack more uh, with more specifics regarding um, where those environmental footprints can be generated along the recycling process and like uh, give us some examples of the impact impacts they could have? Yeah, so I, as I mentioned in my presentation, so like the main drawback of Paro, which is kind of the original way of uh, producing metals is the amount of carbon uh, dioxide that are produced because pretty much you burn the graphite or you add more fuel to uh, to burn uh, the material. So, uh, so that's the the alternative method that's been developed to uh, avoid the large carbon emission has been the leaching method, uh, which is adds more impact on the toxicity or the treatment you have to do with uh, 
with leaching uh, materials. But when I, what I want to clarify though is like recycling always have a much lower environmental impact than primary material production because like if you want to have like cobalt, you would still need to go mine the material and it will go through like pyro and the same process. So like the comparison, it, it is much lower, which uh, doesn't mean we shouldn't do this kind of analysis and evaluating the environmental impact of recycling, because when we do it, we can identify uh, area where we can improve. So in particular, like uh, if we evaluate and look at uh, hydrometallurgy and realizing that well, like part of the waste that we're producing still has a lot of like valuable material. So it helps keep improving the method. And uh, I think that's what is happening with recycling. So I think it is kind of relevant with the other discussion about like the changing chemistries. So as we're moving towards uh, different chemistry with less cobalt, less um, nickel and so on, and more iron phosphate or new materials, it's not like those uh, recycling methods will become irrelevant. Uh, they are just being adjusted or modified so they are better um, at uh, recycling those other uh, materials. So in particular, like pyro used to be like, you just lose all the lithium and it was really wasteful, but now like there's new methods for not only like recycling the metals, but like the other components there. But as other pointed out, like if we can also just not lose anything and kind of put everything back in new battery, that would be kind of the ultimate dream there. But I think, uh, we're, we're moving in the right direction and it's exciting to see a lot of different uh, research and development in recycling. So we have a lot of different options and some of those options might work better with certain chemistry than others. Uh, and hopefully we can um, optimize this uh, recycling process over time. Absolutely. Well, that, that sounds very, very exciting. And hopefully indeed we will see more this kind of novel research out there. And my next question, uh, maybe I would like to uh, put it to you, Yetming. So it seems like better battery designs are really key to enable more sustainable battery recycling. Um, and the attention is received by like what um, Andy show, showed in his presentation, the blade batteries make a prime example. But advancing battery design is perhaps easier said than done, given the potential trade-offs between better performance, profitability, and environmental footprint, I think, which has also been touched upon in your presentation. So, I mean, from your perspective, what is the key holy grail in battery design that would allow us to minimize those trade-offs? Mm. Yeah, uh, well, I think that uh, Andy touched on a, a lot of them, and the examples uh, that you just gave also touch on. So you would like a very low assembly costs, uh, low cost materials uh, you would like uh, and uh, ease of recycling all those things together I think that you know if we were to try to generalize we would say that large cells are better than small cells which is I think a point that Andy also made flat cells are going to be better than cylindrical cells now, cylindrical, cylindrical cells you have a can to deal with you have to uh, take it apart and uh, you know uh, this binder question now uh, if, if you think about how we make the battery electrodes today, the fact that we, number one, use a binder. So we use plastic to glue the whole thing together. Right? And then we heat it up and, and compress it under tons per linear inch. Right? Yeah, produce a, we do, uh, uh, I've often referred to calendaring as the stupid process. It's the last thing you want to do. Right? You're crushing this uh, old material and you're, you know, increasing your tortuosity in the primary transport direction. That's all, you know, that's all wrong, right? And so, um, uh, so if you take all these things together and you say, well, what's happening today? Uh, are we actually evolving away from this 30 year old technology? I think it's recognized. So for example, if you look at what Tesla is doing, you know, they are working on a, a extruded electrode, a completely dry process, right? If you look at what 24M is doing, what I described, is a completely wet process. Right? And so those are two limits. So I think you'd rather do all dry or all wet rather than dry, wet, dry. Right? Uh, and so I do think that the extruded electrode, the all dry process, has the deficiency that it requires even more binder. You basically have to extrude the plastic. I think that's less conducive to recycling than what I talked about earlier. So I would make that differentiation as well. Right? 
uh, but what but that also uh, you know uh, that at least gets around removes the number of the steps such as the solvent evaporation and recapture and the energy involved with that okay so those are some of the i would say those are some of the elements of uh, what we're looking for you know when we started uh, tr developing this uh, technology, the semi-solid electrode technology that I talked about earlier, uh, I had the sense that you know where we were this is, uh, even ten years ago in the development of lithium-ion batteries was that if you were to take a group of you know really you know uh, competent battery engineers and scientists and put them down together and say here are the active materials that we like, you know here's the anode, here's the cathode design a process to make this into a battery. The process that you would end up with is not what we know as the lithium-ion battery today. Okay. Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks, Yaming, for your insights. And mm -hmm. Andy, would you like to uh, add some comments? Or... No, I think I think that's exactly right. I mean, I think we uh, are, um, you know, somebody has, has, has come along and sort of said, you know, that the binder must be, you know, stable. That's the most important thing we want. Um, and so we, we've been left with this um, uh, you know, historical legacy of, of PVDF as, as, a, as a binder, um, when actually PVDF isn't that stable. And, you know, there, there's been many studies which have shown that, it, in fact, it's a very efficient fluorinating agent. Um, part of the degradation of many of these batteries is, is due to the binder. Uh, so I, I think that you know what we're trying to do is, is to actually redesign this backwards, which is to sort of say you know exactly as, as Yemin's just said, you know, it's it really is saying how would we like to make these things, um, and you know what would we like to make them out of. Uh, so from our point of view, what we would like to have is something that that's water based, um, but isn't necessarily cast. Um, and so you know, we've done lots of work using. Um, alginate based um, systems, so things which can come from you know, sustainable sources. Uh, and there's a lot of literature in that in that area. Uh, and it works very well for anodes, but not yet for cathodes. But there's some very interesting work with um, sodium ion batteries that show that some, some weird and wonderful um, things can be used with different battery chemistries if, if you just, you know, as, as we've just been discussing, go back to the drawing board. So yeah, I think it, it won't be very long before we, we sort of um, are looking at the, the legacy that we currently have um, and sort of saying, well, why did we do it that way? Thanks a lot, Andy. That, that's that's really, really interesting. Um, so for the next question, I think it's it's more from a business angle maybe, and uh, I would also like to pitch it to Yetming. So to facilitate better recycling, some uh, forerunner regions like the EU now adopts extended producer responsibility so that batteries, battery companies, they will be responsible for collecting the batteries at their end of life. And I mean, given your rich experiences in private industry and as the co-founder of a few uh, new tech startups, what is needed from your aspect to incentivize companies to take such extended producer responsibility would carrot be better like some subsidies or the stick be better like impose regulations or a combination of both yeah yeah I'll maybe just start with a really general statement so I'm not I'm uh, I'm not that much of a policy uh person uh, but what I will say is that you know as technologists what we should be doing is developing the right alternatives so the you know, realistic alternatives so that policy changes can take place because policy changes don't happen unless there's a plausible alternative, right? And so, so I, I would put myself in that camp as, as opposed to someone trying to figure out what the best policy is. So, uh, so first of all, you know, if you're in the business of climate tech and trying to decarbonize the world, the last thing you want to be is a polluter, right? So yeah, yeah, hearts and minds are all in the right place. And I think it's just that, so I think that uh, anyone developing uh, clean tech today has the full life cycle in mind. Right? Already are thinking about what will have to happen to this product at the end of life. And it's a natural thing to be thinking about, you know, how will it be recycled? Uh, I think that um, from the point of view of, you know, should we force the producer to own the, the, the end of the supply chain as well? You know, I'm not sure that that is um, necessarily the best uh, business. It doesn't, you know, if it were so strict that it didn't allow for different business uh, 
options, uh, I would be opposed to it. So for example, you know, you're trying to uh, develop a recycling uh, industry like we've been talking about here. Now, uh, so uh, having the ability to capture that part of the economic pie may well be enabling to the recycling industry in a way that it wouldn't be available if the original uh, manufacturer were responsible for the entire uh, life cycle. Right? So uh, that's my general answer is that I, you know, I, I don't know that it's necessary uh, to, uh, to apply that kind of regulation, uh, but I see that any guys comments, so <laughs> I'll hand it off. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, I can. Yeah, I can add a little bit. Uh, well, I'm actually an environmental policy, so I do look at what is the impact of different policy and how it could play. Uh, so usually it's back both. Like you don't want to just punish everybody, but I think um, we need for like the car. Like someone pointed out earlier that uh, current battery are what is the most recycled product right now. So we actually already have a like a system that works for lead acid battery in car because people don't just replace those for no reason. And there's like a collect everything. So it is working for uh, battery and because the car manufacturers are responsible for those batteries. This is like something at the, in the U S for like at the federal level uh, that, uh, that just happened. And it's because you have like a small deposit on your, on your battery for like the, I think, like the only advantage I would see for like the producer responsibility is that usually when you have that, it uh, it helps motivate uh, manufacturers to think about the end of life, uh, to design more for the end of life, to have batteries more easier to dismantle. They see that they are going to be responsible for that, then they have advantage to this to choose design that um, are not like all glued together and take like two hours to dismantle because they want to also save at the end of. Life. So the benefit of pushing a little bit of producer responsibility would be that. But on the other end, uh, like uh, the car manufacturers usually don't make the battery. They purchase other ones. So like who would be responsible? Would it be like the manufacturer that buy battery from someone or would it be like the uh, like the battery manufacturer itself? So it's a little bit unclear who that would be. Uh, the other thing I wanted to add is usually when you produce a responsibility, uh, there's kind of a risk that some of those uh, manufacturers will went will go bankrupt or not be 10 years or 15 years. What happened in this case, it's unclear. You have like a bunch of battery and if you have that have no cobalt or no valuable materials, like nobody will want to, nobody will run <laughs> to get them and recycle them as they are right now with uh, current batteries. So, so it's not like just putting uh, producer responsibility is not going to solve all the issue. We need to think more as a system in all of those uh, what if scenario uh, and in the long term what will happen when uh, there is no uh, real right now it's easier for Carmen to say yeah, I want to be responsible I want those batteries because they want them and <laughs> they want, like the access to the material supply to make sure they are able to but in long term, those battery and it's just an expense then nobody will really jump into saying well I want to be responsible and take care of those batteries it's somebody else business uh, after like they've used their vehicle Thanks a lot, Anik. I think you raised a really good point regarding there's a need of kind of um, cross community or cross stakeholder collaboration because just bearing the responsibility, just put the respons responsibility for one single stakeholder, it seems like a quite high risk game and it's um, maybe not so fair. But pulling up that point, um, so apart from recycling, uh, as shown in your talk, um, and it, it seems like there are other options such as remanufacturing and repurpose of lithium ion batteries that could create uh, additional opportunities to return batteries uh, in the value chain as long as possible. So from a life cycle aspect and considering the, the social environmental footprint along the life cycle, what are the advantages and disadvantages of those second life options apart from recycling? Yeah, I think people think straight to like sick life, but I think before that you need to even just think about like repurposing. I think there's gonna be a like batteries replacement as we more EV and everything. So that's always like the best uh, step to do to use the battery is and just move it to like a, some of the module themselves. Uh, for a second life battery, I think, um, and I've worked on that for how many years now. So it was 
like in theory, it's a really good idea because uh, in like uh, in electric vehicle, like people would replace them after like uh, they drive to eighty percent of the capacity. But as you heard before, that's not what is happening. Particularly not for like hybrid vehicle. Like people keep their battery for longer because they can use their vehicle. That might not be as true for like electric vehicle. That uh, but like eighty every thing when they are building uh, the potential of second. But it is like a, an artificial number, like probably the lifetime or the capacity drop before people decide to change it will be different. So in theory, it's good from a cycle perspective because you have something that is valuable and you put it in an application and use it for like another, if it's like in fast charger, probably just one or two years before they degrade too much. But if you put it in a residential, they can last another five years. So that would be good. I think uh, this is a good idea when we have enough uh, supply of battery and uh, and a lot of battery that have lower value, uh, that will help the kind of the weight problem. I don't think, uh, well, I've tried to do more on like second life battery and in the US it's really hard to get used batteries because all the used battery are sent for recycling. I was trying, like the state of Michigan wanted me to test and see second life battery and it took me forever to find second life battery. Because they get recycled, I actually had to import it from Europe. So that makes sense. Um, so it, that's why I say, in theory, it makes sense. That's a you want to extend the, uh, the lifetime of the battery. But in the short, if uh, we need all those material back in the primary battery production, uh, I think for the next five, 10 years, it's not going to really happen. So the only, I kind of mentioned that quickly, the only application I see that makes sense would be probably for something that will degrade the battery really fast, like a fast charger, uh, where it will only be used for another year you send it for recycling. But if you put it uh, in, um, and we did like testing on battery on like residential storage, it will last forever. And nobody wants those battery to last forever in a house for, that's just like a, well, while other type of battery could um, work there. So, so I'm not against it. I think we need to think about it, we need to plan for it. Uh, it's a good solution long-term, uh, but it will also need some kind of work on how to pack them, how to like certify them, how to warranty them, uh, which we don't necessarily have all of those answers right now. Absolutely. Thanks, Annie, for your insights. That's that's brilliant, um, brilliant comments there. Um, and so you you touch upon some EU uh, regulations, EU uh Scenarios. I like to pitch the next question to to Andy. Um, so the EU la launched a new regulation later last year, such that now making batteries more sustainable and circular is written in the law. And this new law seems to set detailed art, uh, targets for better recycling. For instance, by twenty twenty five, which is just next year, um, the recovery rate of lithium, nickel, and cobalt should be 50%, 90%, and 90%. How challenging do you think, Andy, are those targets given today's mainstreaming recycling infrastructure and what te technical innovations must be put in place to make those targets not just a pipe dream? I, I think um, what you need to know, so I, I work with uh, quite a few people who are interested in, in the legal side of things, is that the, the words that are used in uh, a lot of these battery directives are actually um, quite loose at the moment. Um, and so that what they're doing is they're saying that it must be from recycled sources, but it doesn't say that it must be from recycled batteries. Um, and so from that, actually, you can you can get around a lot of those um, uh, those limitations. I think you know, getting towards um, you know, high lithium recoveries, um, cobalt and nickel recoveries are actually not too difficult. The question is then what do you do with them? So recovery is easy. Uh, it it's again comes back to just semantics in terms of you know, what, what do you have to do with them? Um, so just making them into black mass, you can claim that you have recovered them. Um, and that's what most people are doing at the moment is just sort of saying I'm, I'm making black mass and therefore I've ticked the box that says I have recovered them. I think that the words will get um, more uh, meaningful as, as technology uh, pro progresses. Um, but we can see already, I think the lithium stories isn't actually that difficult. So part of our reblend project, I think we're getting 97% of lithium back in a 98% purity. Um, 
So I, I think actually the lithium bit is is probably the easy part because a lot of that comes out in from the aqueous streams, um, and one of our partners is doing it through uh, sort of membrane technology, which is which is trivial uh, to do. Um, I think that so the nickel and cobalt. I think the words that are there at the moment are actually quite easy to um, to get around, um, and I think that those words will change as as we get better at it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, um, Andy, for those insights. And um, I guess we're now approaching to the time. So our final roundtable lightning part, uh, what one topical recommendation you would like to suggest for more sustainable and circular uh, battery? Future, uh, maybe we will start from Yetming, who shows the first on my screen. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I get to go first. You know, uh, so battery research kind of comes in these waves. And for a number, for a decade, there was a huge uh, emphasis on, you know, metal air batteries. Uh, and it, it wasn't, the progress didn't uh, move fast enough, perhaps. And so we've moved away from, you know, there's an inherent advantage uh, to a battery which uses air as one of the electrodes. <laughs> Big cost advantage there. I think it's uh, in, yeah, I think we've learned enough this time to give all of those metal air batteries of all the different stripes another good run and see how much you can squeeze out of them. Yeah. Lovely. Definitely. And uh, maybe next, Annick. Yeah, I think one recommendation is more like general that the different part of the supply chain need to talk to each other. Uh, like that we need not just to plan recycling or end of life. Uh, as, like we're making really bad assumption about like how much there will be and what the chemistry would be because we don't necessarily talk with like the, like a lot of the what is coming next and like what really will be the battery of the future. Uh, so I think these different parts need to talk to each other because how we design future technology could help uh, managing the end of life. So uh, there needs to be better communication between those different aspects of research. Absolutely. Thanks, Enik. And Andy? Yeah, I think Yetming's got it sort of uh, spot on in, the, in terms of, you know, I think that um, firstly, we need we need to relax. You know, it is it is going to be an evolution. We need lithium now. Yes, we're probably going to move to sodium. And yes, we're probably going to end up with, yeah, it's going to end up being iron or it's going to be aluminium or you know, magnesium, it's going to be one of the earth abundant elements that, that solves it. And, and what we need to do is, is to learn from nature. You know, we haven't got mostly iron uh, or aluminium on, on the surface for, for no reason at all. Uh, and if we're going to get energy, then it, we're going to have to use those, those earth abundant elements to make it sustainable. But it's going to take us, you know, 20, 30 years to get there. So, yeah, it's an evolution. We will solve it somehow. We will solve it. Thank you so much, Andy. And thank you all so much for your enlightening closing remarks. And I, I like to uh, take this opportunity to express our sincere gratitude to all of our esteemed speakers and for their inspiring talks and thought provoking insights that help us to envision how to build sustainability into better value chains from cell design, manufacturing, usage, and end of life governance. We appreciate your vision for establishing a more powerful, smart, and sustainable battery future. And as Cellpress Energy Flagship Journal Jewel and Sustainability Flagship Journal Wonders, we would love to continue to be homes for novel and outstanding sustainable battery research works. 